Savai Singha, the Jagiradhar of Lorani, a Jagir under Jaipur state, comprising 12,000 bighas of land. He was born in 1913. As he grew, his qualities of head and heart inspired the chron uh, chroniclers of the estate to write verses in his praise. But Savasina was unhappy because in spite of all his good qualities, he was not developing as a Kshatriya. He was averse to meat and wine and was totally opposed to any kind of violence. In Navaratri, which is the Durga Puja, the nine days of Durga Puja, on the occasion of the worship of Goddess Durga in his house, when animal sacrifice was made, he used to leave the place because he could not bear the sight of the blood of an innocent animal being shed for the appeasement of the goddess. Savai Sinaji wanted him to take interest in firing, riding, and hunting, etc., the traditional pursuits of Akshatriya. But none of these activities suited his temperament. He was interested in religious talks, the company of sadhus, the study of scriptures, and the worship of deities. Savai Sinaji thought that marriage might turn his mind from these things and make him a true Kshatriya. So he married him at the early age of 17. Although his wife was beautiful and he also had a son from her, she failed to win, to win him away from his religious mooring. On the other end, his married life fanned the fire of Varagya, which had been slowly burning in his heart since long by exposing truly the hollowness of the world and all its enjoyments. Srimad Bhagavatam says, He who is devoted to the Lord, the repository of supreme good, revels in the ocean of nectar. He cannot feel drawn towards the enjoyments either of this world or the next, which are to him like a, the turbid water of a muddy pool. Manasina was born with strong samskaras of devotion. It was therefore natural that all worldly objects and enjoyments should appear to him as turbid. Being the eldest son of his father, he was the rightful heir to his rich estate. He had everything that the world could give him, power, wealth, health, pride of birth, respect, affection of parents, beautiful wife, and so on. But these appeared to him like live baits thrown by Maya 
to Antis and capture him and keep him bound to the world to suffer all its miseries and the fearful cycle of birth and death. His heart pined for the lotus feet of the Lord, which alone could give him eternal peace and happiness. He decided to throw off the mantle of Maya and proceed headlong on the path that led to the desired goal. But he did not know how to proceed. He used to listen the instructions of Sri Narayan Swami, a saint who came to his mother, and Sri Gopal Dasji, a saint of Dadu Sampradaya, to whom he went often, often went. Dadu Sampradaya, you know which is Dadu Sampradaya? No. But they could not convince him. He had heard of Thakur Kushal Sinaji, the Jagaridar of Gijagara, who had become famous in Rajasthan as the most advanced devotee of his time amongst the Rajputs. He lived in Jaipur. So one day, Manasina quietly slipped away from home and went to Jaipur. He met Kushal Sinaji. After introducing himself, he described his mental state and requested for guidance. Kushal Sinaji said, the reason why you're so disturbed and unhappy is that you have chosen the Gyan Marga, the path of knowledge, while your natural inclination is towards bhakti. Bhakti is the best and the easiest path for God realization. It is also the surest way for the attainment of peace <laughs> because it is of the very nature of peace and supreme joy. What should I do for the attainment of bhakti? Inquired Manasina. The center of bhakti is Vrindavan. You should go there. Whom should I meet and surrender to in Vrindavan? You should meet Pandit Ram Krishna Das Baba, who is a Siddha saint. He is the very incarnation of bhakti. Manasina did not lose time. Forthwith, he started for Vrindavan. On reaching Vrindavan, he stayed with a sadhu in Shahajanpur Kibagicha, near Dauji Kibagicha, the present site of Vrindavan Research Institute, where Pandit Ram Krishna Das Baba used to live. On account of humility, he could not master courage to go and meet Pandit Baba directly. Every morning, he went and stood at a place from where he could see Pandit Baba going out of his cottage to ease nature. As he went along, Mansina made obeisance to him. He nodded in reply, but never said anything. He did not even lift his head to see who he was. Three months passed like this. One day, Pandit Baba cast a glance at him out of curiosity and asked, Who are you? Man Sina 
introduced himself. Baba asked, What for do you stand here every day? For your darshan, replied Man Sina. Baba did not say anything further. One month, one more month passed like this. Then Baba asked one day, Where do you live? In Shahajampura Kibagicha, replied Man Sina. Baba said, At four o'clock in the evening, we have kata, religious discourse. In Daoji's Bagicha, you may come and attend. Man Sina started going. Baba was impressed by his earnestness and enthusiasm in devotion. One day he said to him, Why not come and live here under some tree? Man Sina, who had so far lived in despondency and gloom, saw a silver lining in the clouds. There was no end to his happiness. He had never imagined that Baba could be so merciful to him. He began to live in his ashram under a tree laden with creepers. <coughs> there were too many monkeys in the bagicha. Bagicha means garden. When Man Sina baked his bread under the tree, the roti, chapati, properly, they used to be on the lookout for an opportunity to pounce and run away with it. Sometimes Pandit Baba himself stood near him with a stick in hand and said, You bake your bread, I shall watch the monkeys. This was too much for Man Sina. How could he bear the burden of Baba Mercy to that extent? But he had to. It was like having to swallow a pill that was bitter yet sweet. Man Sina's parents were much distressed at his sudden disappearance from home. They organized an intensive search. In the end, they came to Vrindavan and found him. They tried to persuade him to return home, but they had to go back disillusioned and disappointed. After staying in Pandit Baba's Bagicha for eight months, Man Sina requested him for Diksha. He advised him to take Diksha from Sri Madhav Das Babaji of Puchari. He took Diksha from Madhav Das Babaji, but continued to regard Pandit Baba as his real guru and practice bhajan under his guidance. Pandit Baba also treated him as his disciple uh, and showered all his affection upon him. He did not allow anyone even to touch his feet, but he allowed Man Sinaji to massage his feet. After Diksha, probably Man Sinaji took Vesha from Madhav Das Baba. Gurudev, Madhav Das Baba is also the Vesh Guru of Param Gurudev, Radha Govinda Das Babaji. Yes, Madhav Das. Madhav Das Baba. But no one knows for certain whether he actually took Vesh and if so, from whom. Though he lived like a Vaishnava Samyasi. He begged for his food 
and stitched his clothes from, ra from, from rugs, mostly thrown away by people. For water, he used an old tin container instead of a caravan, which is an earthen pot usually kept by sadhus in Braja. Because Karaba was likely to break, and every time it broke, a fresh effort had to be made for its procurement. People did not know his sannyas name, but they called him Bhagatji. His parents and others who loved and respected him often came to see him. When they saw him in this condition, there was no end to their grief. The contrast between his princely style of life at home and his present life as a recluse was too much for their tender heart to bear. A picture of Man Sina in princely dress with sword in his hand can even now be seen in Bhagavat Nivas, an ashram in Raman Reti, Vrindavan, built by Sri Kripasindu Das Baba, the foremost disciple of Pandit Baba. Someone once asked Kripasindu Baba why he had kept in his ashram the picture of Man Sina as the hair appearant of a big Jagiridhar, means in his royal dress, instead of his picture as a sadhu. He replied, People would know Man Sina Ji better if they know what he was before he became a sadhu. How many people who roll in wealth and have every other thing that a man can desire or expect from this world, renounce the world like him as a trifle or a trap laid out by Maya? After some time, Pandit Baba left the world. His separation became unbearable to Man Sina. He wept day and night and roamed about crying, Ha Baba, Ha Rade, Ha Baba, Ha Rade, like one who had gone mad. His parents thought that he had actually gone mad. Forcibly, they took him to Lorani for treatment. Mansina gave up food and drink in protest. But his parents regarded this also as a phase of his madness. They kept the choicest fruits, sweets, and other delicacies in his room to entice him. But he did not even look at them. For 18 days, he did not take even a morsel of food and became too weak. He said to his parents, I will not eat anything until you send me back to Vrindavan. They were obliged to send him back to Vrindavan. But in Vrindavan, they made elaborate arrangements for his stay in Dhiraj Lal Ki Bagicha. They kept a cow and two servants for his service, which he did not like. He also did not like to live in Dhiraj Lal Ki Bagicha because other sadhus also lived there. He wanted to live in solitude. So he shifted to Bihar. Uh, he shifted to Bihari, and two servants followed him. Then he stopped taking a cow's milk 
and started begging from Akshetra, a place where food is distributed free to the beggars. He begged two breads every day from the Akshetra. Finally, in order to get rid of his people completely, he disappeared from the Bagicha and lived in hiding in some unknown place for six months. His people tried to search him, but in vain. He returned to Bihari Jiki Bagicha when the servants and the cow had been removed from there. When again his people came to see him, he told them frankly, you must not come to me now. Now I have no relationship with you. Your coming disturbs me in my bhajan. And they went back. In the month of Magh, they came again. This time, Man Sinaji asks his brother Madan, can you go to Mathura? Yes, why not? replied Madana. Then you go and bring for me Bayirvasa, a sheet worn as a lower garment, a chadar, and a mat. I want to go to Pandit Baba, but my clothes, which have been prepared from rugs collected from different places, are impure. When I go to him, my clothes should be pure. Besides, you know, Palguna, the month of holy is approaching. I shall need scent and gulal for Radharani. Kindly bring them too. Perhaps Man Sinaji had received a call from Pandit Baba and was preparing to go to him in eternal Vrindavan. His people thought that he wanted to go to Pandit Baba Samari in Bhagavat Nivas. They were both surprised and happy to find that he had for the first time asked for some service from them. This was an indication to them that his madness was gone and he would turn more and more towards them and accept more service from them. Madana brought everything from Mathura. Mansina asked him to keep them in an Almira wardrobe in his room. Then he asked his people repeatedly to go back home. They went back but left their servant, servant Rangila, to look after him. Two days after they had gone, in the year 1945, Man Sinaji went to Radhavallab's temple for darshan in the morning and saw Ras Lila in Unya Baba's ashram. Then, after bathing in Davanal Kunda, he returned to Bagicha. Just at that time came Rangila. He asked Rangila, Do you know Bhagavat Nivas? I do not know, but I can inquire and go. Then you go. Tell Kripasindu Das Baba that Bhagatji has asked for Pandit Baba's prashad and it is Prashadi Kanti. After Rangila had gone, Man Sinaji put on the new Bahirvas and lay down on the mat, covering himself with a new chadar. When Rangila returned, he was shocked to see Man Sinaji lying on the mat with his eyes fixed above him in a particular direction, as if he was anxiously waiting for the arrival of someone dear to him. Tears incessantly flowed from his eyes, 
as if he was unable to bear, even for a moment, the delay in his arrival. The feel of scent and gulal kept by his side indicated that he was ready for his ceremonial welcome. Rangila said, Radhe Radhe, I have brought the prashad. Man Sinaji extended his hand without turning his eyes from the direction in which they were fixed. Rangila gave him the prashad and the kanti. Man Sinaji put a particle of the prashad in his mouth and the kanti on his neck, with his eyes still fixed in the same direction. Rangila went running to Sri Chajuramaji, who lived in the Bagicha, and said, Go and see what has happened to Bhagatji. If necessary, please call a doctor. Chajuramaji rushed to see Man Sinaji. From what he saw, it did not appear to him that he was unwell. He took Rangila outside and said, Man Sinaji seems to be meditating. You should not disturb him. Watch him from a distance. If necessary, call me again. Chajuramaji went back. Rangila returned to the cottage of Mansina. While returning, he heard him saying in a low voice, Jai Ho, as if, as if he was greeting someone. So maybe Jai Ho. The next moment, when he reached the cottage, Mana Sinaji was not there. Where had he gone? He had gone in his Siddha Manjari, their spiritual body as a Manjari, to transcendental Vrindavan. Pandit Baba had come in his Siddha Manjari's Varupa to take him to the Nikunja of Radharani to serve Radha and Krishna with Saint Angulao while they were engaged in the love pastime of Holi. Jai Shri Man Sina Rajvata Ki. Yeah. Sure. Difficult to see. <laughs> Is it possible to ask one question? Radhe, Radhe? I think so. <laughs> I think it's possible. So, uh, my question is about Lava Matra. Is it possible that we all actually already receive this lava matra, but is necessary uh, to purify it, our heart or false ego, and it will be manifested? Or lava matra is really one second when, uh, when mm, by mercy of Gurudev and sadhus, we have some vision of the darshan, and after that, this. Uh, uh, our heart become purified. For example, I also in the uh, in the example of of Gurudev when he received mercy from Radha Govinda Das Babaji. This is my question also, even for Gurudev, if you like to say something about that. Thank you so much.
Rude. Thank you, sir. Rade, Rade. Rade, Rade. Actually, it's just is not possible in love matra something can happen in few second of time cannot possible to happen but by the mercy of of the <laughs> <laughs> of East and Guru Dev, it's possible to happen because we cannot remove our false ego. And we cannot accept his mercy, what he want to give us. <coughs> Only by His grace is possible that for some second false ego is not capturing my heart and that moment I want to realize it. And that realization gives the reason to understand everything. Is a realization. Mind cannot understand this without realization. <coughs> By mercy, we have to realize it. Then acceptance comes. This realization is not any place. Only this line we can see, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha Sadhu Siddhi. But if, without realization, if not understanding is clear, we have to realize this is my experience. Anyone has any question or wants to share anything? Or we continue. Okay, we continue. Raj Rishi Sri Banamali Raj Badura. Born in 1863, Raj Rishi Banamali Raja Bahadura was the landlord of Tanas in district Babana of East Bengal. He was conferred the title of Raja by the British government. He had inherited the religious samskaras of his parents. While he was still in the womb, his father, Sri Ganga Prasad Roy, and his mother had gone on pilgrimage to Puri on foot. Not very long after his birth, the parents gave him in adoption the Raj Banavari Lala. 
the landlord of Tanas and went to Vrindavan for bhajan. Banavari Lal died when Banamali Lal was only 17 years old. The burden of running the affairs of the big Zaminadari of Tanas fell upon his shoulders. Like a noble landlord who had the well-being of his people very much at heart, he started constructing wells and rest houses and opened schools and hospitals in his estate. But his inner life from the very beginning was that of a sadaka. He had come under the influence of Brahma Sampradaya and was practicing sadhana according to the teachings of the Sampradaya. The story of his life <coughs> is mainly connected with the story of his family deity, Sri Rad Vinodaji. Originally, Rad Vinodaji was found mysteriously by Sri Vancharamji, the Adhikari managing authority of Navagram, a village in Tana's estate. Vancharam was a very devoted person. Every day before his Seva Puja, he went to bathe in the river Karatoya in Navagram. <coughs> One day, while he was bathing, he heard someone saying in a sweet voice, Take me out of water to your home. Vancharam looked all around, but he could not discover the source of the voice. He went home after bathing, but the voice kept ringing in his ears. The next day, when he went for, to bathe, he again heard the same voice, but he could not locate where it came from. The third day, when he was going out of the river after bathing, he heard the voice again and simultaneously felt that something had clung to his feet. He brought it out. And lo, it was the beautiful idol of Rad Vinoda. For some time, he stood dazed and petrified. Then he hugged it and bathed it with the tears of his eyes. There was a repulsion, shivering and sweating all over his body. <clears throat> Rad Vinoda alone knows how long and how intensely he had cherished the desire to be hugged by his devotee and to bathe in his tears of joy and love. <coughs> he did not even hesitate to touch his feet for its fulfillment. Nothing strange for him, for he is the Lord of love. He loves his devotees and love is blind. Vancharamji brought him home. After due ceremony, he began to serve him as best as he could. But Vinodaji, as Vancharam called him, was very luxurious. There was no end to his demands. He would sometimes ask for sweets of different kinds sometimes for new and fancy dresses, and sometimes for scent and other luxurious things. When Vancharam could not fulfill his demand, he either urged someone else or himself 
brought the things he wanted somehow from somewhere, even though he had to steal or plunder. Once Vinodaji wanted to eat vegetable prepared from mustard flowers. After sunset, he went to the field of a farmer and began to pick mustard flowers. The farmer heard the sound of someone seeking the field. He shouted, who is there? Vinodiji quickly tied the flowers in a corner of his pitambara, a yellow sheet worn as upper garment by Krishna, and ran away. At night, he said to Vancharam in a dream, Since long, I have not eaten vegetable prepared from mustard flowers. You offer it to me today. Vancharam did not know where he could get mustard flowers because there was no field within a couple of miles from his place in which mustard was grown. He was filled with some anxiety. When he went to Vinodaji's temple for morning service, he was surprised to see some mustard flowers adorning both of his ears and some tied to a corner of his pitambar. He understood that Vinodji had himself brought the flowers from somewhere so that he might not have to take the trouble of going out in search of them. He prepared vegetable from the flowers and offered it to him. One does not know how Vinodji got into the habit of smoking hookah, bubble bubble. Possibly some devotee who had served him before used to smoke. He was not conversant with the rules of ritualistic worship and did not know what should or should not be offered to the deity. He lovingly offered the hookah to Vinoji before smoking, and Vinoji not only accepted the offering, but enjoyed it because it was made in love. Once Vinodji asked a wealthy devotee in a dream to offer him a hookah. The devotee offered him a hookah with a long pipe and a silver mouthpiece. Vinodji smoked every morning and evening after Rajbog, offering of principal meals. Some fortunate devotees could at times also hear the hubble bubble of the hookah. Vancharam was very hospitable. Whosoever came to his village, for him, his doors were always open. If he chose to stay for some time, he was well served. One night, when he and his wife were sleeping, three guests knocked at his door. Vinodji did not want that his sleep should be disturbed. He went to the door in the form of his son and received the guest. He told them, Pitaji, my father, is asleep. I can awaken him if you so desire. Otherwise, you may cook for yourself. I shall arrange for the provisions and everything else. No, you don't disturb his sleep. We shall cook for ourselves, replied the guest. Vinodji went to the shop from where Vancharam used to purchase provisions 
and say to the shopkeeper, Vancharamaji has sent me to get some provisions from you on loan. Please give. How can I give the provisions to a person like you, who is not, who is not known to me? I never saw or heard about you before, replied the shopkeeper. Then Vinoji took out the gold bangle he was wearing and said, You keep this with you as surety and return it to Vancharamji after he has cleared the account. The shopkeeper agreed. Vinoji went back home with the provisions and made all other arrangements for cooking. The guests cooked and ate and then went to sleep. Next morning, when Vancharam saw the guests, he asked, When did you come? Who opened the door? You were asleep when we came. Your son opened the door and made all arrangements for our dinner. We did not like to disturb you. Vancharam stood stunned for a while. Could this be the Lila of Vinoji? He began to think. At noon, when the shopkeeper came with a bangle, the mystery was solved. For long, Vinoji was without a consort. His loneliness began to weigh heavy upon him. Sportive as he was, he began to think of marriage. He decided to marry Raj, Raja Banavari Lala's 10 or 11 years old daughter, whose name was Radha. He directed one of his devotees to Raja Banavari Lal and speak about him in such a way that he is obliged to come for his darshan. <coughs> the devotee went and said to the Raja, in the village Navagram of your own estate, your own employee Vancharam has found a murti of Sri Krishna. The deity is very much alive and sportive. Every day he surprises everybody by performing a new lila. Hundreds of people go to him for darshan. Will you not go? How did Vancharam find the deity? What lilas does he perform? asked Raja Banavari Lal out of curiosity. Okay. So we know G. It's calling. Lila. The devotee told him everything. He felt very much attracted. One day, he went for the darshan of Vinoji along with his wife and daughter Radha. As they were looking at Vinodji, Radha felt very much excited. She clasped her mother and said, Look, Ma, how Thakur is smiling at me. Foolish, said Ma, the mother, as she affectionately patted her on her cheek. No, Ma, he is really smiling and winking at me. But Ma ignored it as her childish fancy. The sweet smiles of Vinoji so captured the heart of Radha that she thought of him day and night. Several times on her insistence, Raja Sahib had to take her to Vinoji with him for his darshan. Slowly, Raja Sahib also became more and more attracted towards Vinodji. Once, 
When he had gone to see him, Radha said to her father, Pitaji, let us take Vinodji to our place. I have a strong desire that I should serve him and decorate him beautifully. Raja said, I also feel like taking Vinodji away, but will Vancharam let us do so? He looked at Vancharam as he said this. Vancharam, instead of acquiescing or denying directly, said, Sir, I am your servant as well as Vinodji's. How can I say that you should or should not take him away? The matter lies between you and Vinodji. At night, Vinodji said to Vancharam in a dream, You let me go with the Raja. I am pleased with you. But now I want to accept the service of the Raja. You need not be sorry, for you will soon realize me. What could Vansharam do? He sent the message to the Raja. The Raja was overwhelmed to know that Vinoji was so kind to him. Immediately, he went and conveyed the message to his wife and Radha. They began to dance with joy. Elaborate arrangements were made to bring Vinoji. On an auspicious day, he was brought to the palace in a palanquin escorted by elephants and horses and musicians performing music on different instruments. Radha now served Vinodji with all her heart and soul. There was no doubt a pujari to serve him, but it was Radha who decided each day what dress he would put on and what he would eat. She also prepared different kinds of ornament from flowers and decorated him with her own hands. Vinoji was very much pleased with her service, but he often teased her. He would sometime, after eating, rub his dirty hands with her clothes, sometimes pinch her, and sometimes even spit with her. Sure. Radha's love towards Vinodji went on increasing. So did Vinod's love pranks. One day, when Radha was offering him a garland, he cocked hold of her anchala, edge of the sari, and said, you must marry me. She spoke about this to her mother, but mother <laughs> did not believe. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. After some time, Radha fell ill. Vinoji said to her mother in a dream, Radha will not survive, but you need not to worry. She will die to live with me as my bride. There is a dry Devadara tree in your garden. Out of the wood of that tree, you make a murti of Radha and marry the murti to me. Radha's mother was then convinced that Vinodji really wanted to marry Radha. She told her husband about the dream. Both of them began to shed tears of sorrow as well as joy to think of this new Lila of Vinodji. They were sorry to know that Radha would not survive, but they were happy to know that Vinodji would accept Radha 
as his bride, and both the daughter and son-in-law would live with them in their house in the form of murtis. The Devadara tree was cut down and the work of making an idol out of it started. As soon as the murti was ready, Radha died. Arrangements for her funeral and her marriage in the form of the murti began to be made simultaneously. When the marriage was performed, Vinalji began to be called Radha Vinod. Even today, Vinod and Vinodini Radha can be seen living happily together in the Tanas temple by the side of Ram Krishna Seva Ashram in Vrindavan. So that should go. Mm. Even today, their marriage anniversary is duly celebrated. Life in Tanas stayed centered around Radha Vinod until Raja Banavari Lal was alive. Katha, Kirtan, and festivals were the order of the day. But these activities slackened when the burden of running the affairs of the estate fell on the shoulders of Banamali Lal. The service of Radha Vinoda was particularly neglected because Banamalilal was initiated in Brahma's uh, dharam, which did not believe in murti worship. The pujari carried on the routine service of the deities. But on account of the negligent attitude of Banamali Roy, no one felt enthusiastic about it. A sudden change came in the attitude of Banamari Roy when one day he met Jagat Bandhu Prabhu, the great saint of Pabana, who, on account of the golden luster of his body and the intensity of his love for Radha and Krishna, was regarded by some as the very incarnation of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That day, Raja Banamali Raja Badura was going through the highway of Pabana in the right royal fashion, mounted on a decorated elephant and escorted by gunmen and other attendants. From the other side, was coming Jagatbandu Prabhu, dancing in the midst of Kirtan party, consisting of hundreds of devotees, who were also singing and dancing to the tune of a large number of Mridangas and Kartal. Banamali Rai got down from the elephant, walked barefooted up to the Kirtan party, and joined it. Like one who was hypnotized, he raised both of his hands and started dancing and singing with the party. He continued doing this until the party reached its destination and stopped Kirtan. After Kirtan, he bowed down to Jagat Bandhu Prabhu requested him to grace Banavari Nagar once by his presence and return it. On return, he felt that a new wave of bhakti was surging in his heart. He felt that traveling on the crest of that wave, he had crossed the desert of Brahma Upasana, meditating on Brahman, and was standing at the threshold of an oasis, rich with the foliage and fountains of bhakti. He found entrance into the oasis when Jagat Bandhu Prabhu came to his house and staying with him 
for a number of days, gave him instructions in Raganuga Bhakti. Then he understood that the Lord was not only an object of reverence, worship, or prayer, as Brahma Samaj had taught him, but also of love or priti. Priti was not one-sided. It was not that the devotee alone loved the Lord. The Lord also loved the devotee. In fact, he loved the devotee more than the, devo the devotee loved him. And nothing was more valuable to him than the loving service of his devotee. Because the devotee in his fallen state had no access to him, he himself came down in the form of Srimurti to receive his service. Banamari Roy's mind now turned towards Radha Vinod. He made the best possible arrangements for his service. But he discontinued the service of the hookah because it was not permitted by the Shastras. During those days, Sri Krishna Sundar Roy Prabhu, who was a Siddha Mahatma, lived with Banamali Roy. He also used to smoke hookah. Before smoking, he offered the hookah to Radha Vinod. Roy Prabhu was always lost in Lila Smara. At the time of smoking also, his Lila Smaran was his primary occupation. Smoking was secondary, and it went on automatically as a matter of habit, though it slowed down when the Smaran was deep. And he put the pipe into his mouth after long intervals. During the intervals, Radha Vinod put the pipe in his mouth and smoked more freely. Thus, he was not very much affected when Banamari Roy stopped his hookah. On the 12th day of Krishna Paksha in the year 1892, Roy Prabhu chose to quit this world. For four days since then, Radha Vinoda had to practice forced abstinence and go without hookah. But abstinence is not in his nature. On the Amavasya day, after the morning service, when the Pujari was doing japa, he sank into drowsiness. In that state, Radha Vinoda said to him, give me my hookah. Since these people discontinued my hookah service, I used to go and smoke with Roy Prabhu. But now that Roy Prabhu is no more, I have not smoked for four days. In the evening, when Banamari Roy went to the temple, the Pujari told him everything. Banamali Roy made necessary arrangements for the service of hookah, but the doubt persisted in his mind as to whether Vinodji really smoked. Once Jagadbandu Prabhu was staying in Banamali's Roy's palace in a room adjacent to the temple of Rad Vinoda. After Raj Bog, he called Banamali Roy and said, Let us today enjoy the hookah smoking Lila of Lila Mai, the sportive lord. He took Banamali Roy with him and sat in the veranda before the temple. After some time, he said, See, Vinodji is smoking. 
Listen to the hubble bubble of the hookah. Simultaneously, Jagat Bandhu gave Banamari Roy the spiritual ears with which he could hear the sound of the hookah. As he was listening to the sound, he went into Bhav Samadhi and tears began to trickle. I know it is, yeah. It's not working. Radhe, okay. We're back. So, I start from the top paragraph. Now, Banamali Roy's fate in the spiritual nature of Srimurti became so firm that if anyone said or did anything which implied that the Sri Murti was a mere statue with hearting. He now became restless to render personal service to Radvinoda. But he was not qualified for service without proper initiation. So in 1897, he went to Vrindavan and took initiation from Sri Radhika Nath Goswami Prabhu, a descendant of Advaita Charya Prabhu. He got so much absorbed in the service of Sri Radha Vinoda that it became impossible for him to do anything else. Fortunately, he had a very capable and trustworthy manager in Sri Kamini Kumar Gosa. He entrusted to him the entire management of the state so that he could devote all his time to the loving service of Rad Vinoda. After some time, he went to Vrindavan and constructed two buildings, one in Vrindavan and the other in Radhakund. These are now known as Tanas Mandir and Rajbani. He lived with Radha Vinod sometimes in Vrindavan and sometimes in Radhakund. Ever since Banamali Roy came to Braja, he was the central figure of the Vaishnav community in Braja. Sadhus and Vaishnavas always graced his house with their presence because Katha, Kirtan and festivals were always going on there. He, uh, he utilized all the resources of his estate in the service of the Vaishnavas. He built a hospital for free treatment of sadhus, Vaishnavas, and the Brajavasis. He started a school for teaching Bhakti Shastras to the students and arranged for their free board and lodging. He also started a press in which he printed Srimad Bhagavatam with eight commentaries and other bhakti literature, which he distributed free amongst the sadhus and the Vaishnavas. In his time, there were a galaxy of Siddha Mahatmas in Braja. He was benefited by the company of each one of them. But there were some to whom he was specially attached and who freely showered their blessings upon him. 
they were Sri Radhikanath Goswami Prabhu, Jagat Bandhu Prabhu, Sri Radha Raman Charan Das Babaji Maharaj, Sri Vijay Krishna Goswami, Sri Gaur Kishore Shiromani, Sri Rama Hari Das Babaji, Sri Krishna Sundar Roy Prabhu, Sri Hari Sundar Bhamika Buyan, Sri Jagadish Das Baba, and Sri Ram Krishna Das Pandit Baba. With the blessings of these Mahatmas, he easily attained the lotus feet and the loving service of Radhavinoda in his eternal dham, Vrindavan. Jai Raj Rishri Shibanamali Raj Badura Roy Ki. Jai. Jai. Can I make word of one question? So there was one part where uh, the previous devotee was taking care of uh, Vinoji when he was alone before he went to the to the Raja to the king. He appeared in a dream and said, "You have to give me to the Raja. Let me go with him. You don't worry. You will soon realize me." Yeah, this little impressed me how. This devotee was already so much in uh, high realization. I think he was always conversing with uh, uh, with his sister they have in dream, and even personally. And still was he did not realize. He said to him, "You will soon realize me." So, like how many steps one has to uh, go before actually one realize. Even this bhav becomes so deep that one. As such a loving relation and can uh, talk, let's say, and always receive darshanas. Still, is not like in the full realization state, but so, like which stage is that already? That one has uh, darshans, let's say, spontaneous darshans uh, of the Easter day. Uh, he realized, so he followed the instruction of this today. And uh, he want to give mercy to the Banmali Rai king and his family that uh, it can uh, they can grow their spiritual life. And he also uh, he went with this to them. He not left him, uh, king, because he was uh, under him. So he, he want to go there. So he fulfilled the desire of this. So he don't uh, is to them not like him, not like that. He never leave this is to them because uh, but uh, with uh, uh, the tackle he went to with him with Parmali. Uh, this is the Jamai Thakur, name is Jamai Thakur, because he married with that girl, and the girl think that I am, is my husband. She, she never married this girl to other. So is is a Jamai Thakur. The king bring him like a Jamai, like a Jamai man's son-in-law. So he, he had parental affection towards Krishna. Ah, he he became father-in-law of yeah. the, the and his son-in-law. This relation there, and the daughter he married with daughter married with a 
बिनोद बिहारी ठाकुर व्हाट इज नेम ऑफ ठाकुर बिहारी ना टाइम is a very big compass and very good place hmm. and he is really taking you know, a smoking hookah jamai thak real story I know up to this only. One two time I went there to see. It was a big compass. Hmm. is all depend upon the devotional <coughs> practice of the devotee Gurudev, when the small girl, she was like ten or eleven year old when she came to see Vinodji first. Mm. So she had divine vision to yeah, see yeah, and yeah. smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The smile and the they are in uh, there. She liked this Vinodji. So and he, and Vinodji also want to go to the king house. Because of her, it's happening, and he went there and he took the service of Vidhan, and they bring to the Vrindavan, and she all the family come here to stay with him. Yeah. and they do by his services yeah mm. Mm. so it is good to have like that this girl had a natural natural devotion uh, towards yeah. towards vinoji uh, like like a uh, like mirabai feeling that like he's my husband and Yeah, Mira Bai, like that, or yeah, Mira Bai relation, similar like same path. Yeah, not Radha Dasi Bai, Mira Bai. No. <laughs> Even she is so young, Guru Dev. Yeah, but how is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And Kumudev, in the story before, his name was Manasina. What does it mean? The devotee name. Yeah. Devotee was who find the Binoji. He was on the. On the day before, Manasina is the previous previous story. Yes. Manasina is the previous story. Sure. Sure. 
and then he get the so what is the other devotee name? Yeah. Good. What is the other devotee? Who is uh, Manjini? Hmm? With Manjini. What is the name? Manjini was first. <coughs> then I can was, was the first story. Uh, like that. One one person who is taking care of me. What is the name? Huh? Binoji. Panchuram. Huh? Not Panchuram. Oh. You don't have books? Not here. <laughs> Where Binoji went, who, what is the name of this? Who give, who give the credit to the and he gives uh, the kala, the, his bank, Binoji keep his golden thing to the... Bancharamji. Bancharamji. Bancharam is serving to him, no? After Mohan Singh. Oh, that, that, that was the previous. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then Vinuji went from Bancha Ram to King. Mansin got the DT and Bancharam is taking care of me. It was not clear how Bancharam did it, his service. How Mansin gave to him? Maybe he's a pujari or what? So. Yeah. Oh, oh. My God. Wow. Who is that? Your dog sister? Yeah, my God. Stop. My God. It's a rope like you. It's simple. For the pasta. <laughs> for the pasta. Pasta pizza. Pasta Thank you. Thank you, Pina. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, so we will uh, end today. Next one is Sri Krishna Chaitanya Das Baba. It's a long story. You can make it. We can meditate on this today mm -hmm. until the next. Does anyone has any question or? Uh, some sharing. I just wanted to say, <clears throat> yeah, please. What really impressed me about the story was how, you know, many times we feel like the deity is the object. Yeah. We objectify so many times, like we worship, we offer things to the deity, deity is object of our devotion. Yeah. But actually, in this story, we see how deity, Murti, is this, it has a subjective nature. The deity says, I want to marry this girl. You see? It's not like the girl who was saying, I have attachment to the Takurji. Takurji is saying, I want to <laughs> see the girl. And then he appears before her and captures her heart. You see? This is a really, like, powerful, the potency, the loving potency is invested in the Murti. You see, so even without our desire, deity can capture us. It's beautiful. And there was another example, too. And I don't remember exactly. My memory is not so good. But um, there was an example, I have to read it again, where the deity manifested the love in the devotee's heart. So the deity initiated this thing, and then the reciprocation took place. So this is kind of like the very 
deep mystical loving potency of the Takuji, of the deity, which it's hard for us to grasp in our minds how this is happening, right? But it's a this is a really good illustration of that and a couple of different instances. I want to read it again to get a deeper, you know, mm -hmm. understanding of it. This, this kind of respiration. So usually, so sometimes we feel love is like a, we love deity, but sometimes we don't, we don't realize deity, you know, kind of respir, you know, deity is respiration. So, but this is give us very much kind of, you know, and hope and how love is strong. And also that devotee who has love, therefore deity reciprocate. If devotee was kind of this uh, is not love, then deity also keep quiet. So this is uh, both side, you know, Raga, Guru Dev said Raga and Anuraga. This is a very beautiful story and also amazing story. <laughs> 